Hello, welcome to the Livestreams Karawara podcast. We're delighted to have you join us. We invite you to sit back, relax, and listen to our latest episode. Thanks for joining. Keep your Bibles ready. We're going to look at Luke chapter 15. So Lord, we come to you, Lord, now, and we ask for your blessings on us as we, as we listen to this message. And Lord, I pray for myself, Lord, may these words come from you. Lord, I pray that you would really reach out, reach out to the lost among us, reach out if we have any elements of those like the Pharisees, Lord, help us to live like we belong in your kingdom. So Lord, we just pray that just as the lost matter to you, may that matter very deeply to us, Jesus, that we'll reach out into our communities, into the homes and share your word, Lord. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you for being with us. In your precious name we pray. Amen. All right, so I hope you've got your Bibles with you. Let's turn to Luke chapter 15. And I'll read the first 10 verses first, and then we're actually going to look at the whole chapter, but we'll look at the first 10 verses. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering round to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Verse 8, Or, suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So Jesus was with sinners and tax collectors. But the Pharisees, as usual, were not very happy about this. Does this sound familiar to you? Well, we know that they didn't like Jesus They were jealous of him and always tried to find a reason to accuse him on breaking the Jewish laws. We also know in Luke 11, Jesus condemned their character and them being very religious. They pretended to fear God, and yet they lacked true justice, love, and compassion. And from verse 1 and 2 of Luke 15, we find that they were grumbling again since Jesus welcomed sinners and even ate with them. And one of the reasons was probably that Jews and Gentiles didn't really mix, right? We find many laws in the Old Testament that prohibited such associations. And, and probably it was so because the people who were not Israelites probably influenced those who were Israelites and led them away from God. The Pharisees and the rabbis also had additional laws for strict observance of such associations. And so it was better to keep away from them altogether, right? Right? But I think that a strict observance of such rules was probably also seen as an act of righteousness to the point of neglecting the poor and the disadvantaged, which included the prostitutes and those on the fringes. And we have seen up until this chapter that Jesus preached the kingdom of God to everyone, whether poor or rich, whether Jew or a Gentile, or healthy or ill. So to this grumbling of the Pharisees and the scribes, Jesus' response was simple. He used three parables, and yet while simple, they profoundly speak of God's heart and his mission. Let's find out. The first two are seen as a double parable, where they are separated by the word or in verse 8. If you look at verse 8, so Jesus just told the story of the lost sheep, and then he says or. In verse 8, suppose a woman has 10 silver, goes on to the story of the lost coin. 
So Jesus is actually asking two rhetorical questions, meaning that the audience, they knew the answers. Right? He, in verse 4, he starts by asking, What person among you has a hundred sheep and loses one and doesn't go out to look for it? And then in verse 8, he says, What woman who has ten drachmas and loses one and doesn't search for it? The answer is obvious, yes, of course. Of course you would go out and look for your lost sheep. Of course you would go out and look for your lost coin. And people understood that. So the parables were not just stories with no meaning. They were stories that had very deep meaning. It tri Jesus tried to explain what he was trying to say so that people could really understand. So, in the first parable, the shepherd searches for his lost sheep out of the hundred and finds it and rejoices. Shall we go to the next slide, Mark? Thank you. Now, some might say that maybe he was poor and he really needed that one sheep. Maybe, but, but it's, not, it's a very, very easy speculation. Because why would then he leave the 99 in the open country and go look for that one lost sheep until he finds it? Because leaving them in the open country was like, come on, pray, eat my sheep kind of thing. You know, They were very vulnerable to, uh, to being harmed. But you see that they were not lost like the other sheep. And so it seems that the shepherd really cared for that one lost sheep. He goes looking for it. And what's more, it says here in verse 5 that when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home and then calls his friends and neighbors together to celebrate with him. He doesn't just drag it behind him. right? It shows that this shepherd really cares. And then Jesus says in verse 7 that in the same way, heaven rejoices when one sinner repents over the 99 righteous who do not need to repent. It means that the 99 are already in the kingdom of God. Isaiah 53, 6, you would remember, says, We all have gone astray like the sheep, and we need our shepherd to come and rescue us. So did our shepherd come? Yes, praise the Lord. Jesus said in John 10, verse 11, that I am the good shepherd. And the Bible says that those who believe in him are like that sheep who was lost and is found. And that we shall not perish. That means we shall not die, but we will have an everlasting life. Sounds familiar? John 3, 16. So we are precious in God's eyes, just like that one sheep, which was precious to the shepherd. And God sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to come and rescue us. And then the lost coin. So the woman searches this coin out of the sil 10 silver coins. And in Greek, it's the 10 drachmas. And each was worth about a day's wages. And she celebrates after finding it. Now, if, you, if, you, if you'd know about the value of the one coin... To give you some idea, it is recorded in some ancient documents that one drachma could buy one liter of oil in Caesarea, Palestine, and in other place, a good 10 liters. So it was quite valuable, and it was precious to her. And it, it might well be that she was poor. I mean, imagine having just the next 10 days worth of savings in your own bank account. Right, it's not a lot. And what joy she had when she found it. She calls her friends and relatives and celebrates with them. And then again, Jesus says in verse 10, remember that in the same way, the angels rejoice when one sinner repents. So the sinner is compared to being lost. And Jesus repeats here that repentance is the key for the sinner to be found. Without God, we are like lost sheep and the lost coin. But we are not sheep and we are not coin. We are humans. So Jesus then really moves on to make the next point in the last parable when he gives us an example that would probably hit home for many. So let's watch this video and then we'll, we'll, we'll look at it. So instead of me reading it, that would do the job for us. <laughs> Two sons. The younger son said to his father, Give me my share of the property. So the father divided his property between his two sons. Not long after that, 
the youngest son packed up everything he owned and left for a foreign country where he wasted all his money in wild living. He had spent everything when a bad famine spread through that whole land. Soon, he had nothing to eat. He went to work for a man in that country, and the man sent him out to take care of his pigs. He would have been glad to eat what the pigs were eating, but no one gave him a thing. Finally, he came to his senses and said, My father's workers have plenty to eat, and here I am, starving to death. I will go to my father and say to him, Father... I have sinned against God in heaven and against you. I am no longer good enough to be called your son. Treat me like one of your workers. The younger son got up and started back to his father. But when he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt sorry for him. He ran to his son and hugged him and kissed him. The son said, Father, I have sinned against God in heaven and against you. I am no longer good enough to be called your son. But his father said to his servants, Hurry, bring the best clothes and put them on him. Give him a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Get the best calf and prepare it so he can eat and celebrate. This son of mine was dead, but has now come back to life. He was lost and now has been found. And they began to celebrate. The older son had been out in the field, but when he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants over and asked, What's going on here? The servant answered, Your brother has come home, safe and sound, and your father ordered us to kill the best calf. The older brother got so angry that he wouldn't even go into the house. His father came out and begged him to go in. But he said to his father, For years I've worked for you like a slave and have always obeyed you. But you have never even given me a little goat so that I could give a dinner for my friends. This other son of yours wasted your money on prostitutes. And now that he has come home, you ordered the best calf to be killed for a feast? His father replied, My son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we should be glad and celebrate. Your brother was dead, but he's now alive. He was lost and has now been found. So, so in this last parable, the youngest son decided to leave home. His father, he rebelled, ran out of money, came to his senses, and he went back to his father. The father had him back and restored everything to him and rejoiced his coming home. His son was lost, but now found. And not only that, he was dead, Jesus adds, but now alive, verse 24. Whereas the older son was always with the father, but behaved as if he was lost. He was, always, he was already with the father. He followed all the rules. He obeyed all the rules and slaved hard but he failed to rejoice when his brother came back home. What kind of love is that? His father even went out to him just like he did with his younger brother or his younger son. And, came, and, and he went out to the older son, but the son was engulfed in bitterness. He was angry. He was jealous. And he grumbled. Now let's go back to verse 1 and 2. Luke starts with this. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to hear him, that is to hear Jesus. They were all gathering around Jesus. And what was the reaction of the Pharisees and the scribes or the teachers of the law? Did they not grumble? Yes. They were grumbling. And we know from our study of this book of Luke so far that the Pharisees or the teachers of the law they believed that they would be saved through works, that they had to really work hard, obey God. They also loved money. They were very religious people. They followed all the rules. And we see that in Mark. We see that in Matthew. They had no compassion, though, when, when someone repented or came in the kingdom of God. And they, they also believed that the kingdom of God was only for the Jews. They love to seek praise from people, and so on and on and on. We've seen that, right? And they had a lot of knowledge of the scriptures as well. But the actions showed something else. And all of this, does it not sound like the older brother here in the story? 
So Jesus is very clever in the way he tells these parables. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were already in God's kingdom, like this older brother. He was already home. He was with the father. And the father tells him, whatever I have is yours. So Jesus is saying, live like it. You belong. Live like it. Rejoice when one sinner repents and comes into the kingdom of God. Be glad and celebrate because God rejoices and the angels and the heavens rejoice when that happens. Without God, we are lost. From these parables, we see three things. Lost, that means we are sinners. Sinners are lost. And we are also dead. But in God, in Jesus, we are found. We are made right. And we are alive. So there is no other way. There is no other way but Jesus. And Jesus showed, he was showing the people how they could be right with God. How they should live. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And we read earlier, Isaiah 53, verse 6 says, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. And this prophecy we see, again, fulfilled through Jesus' coming on the earth, his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. And what do we do? Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that's the promise of God. And I praise God that many of us have tasted God's goodness and, his, and, and the fulfillment of that promise. So when we repent, meaning when we say sorry to God for getting lost, he forgives us with open arms. He gives us a big hug. He meets us. He talks with us. And he celebrates. And the whole heaven celebrates. The angels rejoice. Even though we can't hear it from here. They do. So my question to us is, the three questions really, were three things. Are you lost? There are two sons here. One was literally lost. The other one behaved as if he was lost. The good news is you can be found. The next question might hurt a little bit, but it's for me as well. Are you like a Pharisee? Well, the good news is we are still alive here, and there is still time. Let's live like we belong. And we can ask God for the same heart as His. And as a church, what can we do? The lost matter deeply to God, right? And so we also look for the lost, and we'll tell them the good news. So that they can be found. Imagine children being lost. I mean, I don't know if some of your you know, parents who are here have lost their children at any point. Or just, you know, they went missing for even a few minutes in a shopping center. Mel's nodding her head. I know mom and, had, mom and dad had that, I think, once. <laughs> it's a terrible feeling. It's as if you've lost your whole, everything that you have. It is so with God. His heart aches when his sheep is lost, his people are lost. So this week, I encourage you, I encourage all of us here to really walk up boldly to somebody you're, sitting, you're, you're seeing sitting down even on the street or at the shopping center, if you, if you shop at Waterford or anywhere that you shop. If you look at this lonely person, somebody who's just looking lost, or not even looking lost, they're just there. Listen to God. Feel what he feels. Go and talk to them. All you have to say is, hi. Hi, how are you going? Can I help you? Can I pray with you? We can ask some bold questions, actually. Because if you think of them, think as a child lost in a shopping center that needs to find his parents. And there are many, many lost people out there. And I asked somebody last week, do you know about Jesus? Do you know who Jesus is? And this person said, not really. But they are very open to listen. And so there are many people out there who are open to listen. All we have to do is walk there and talk. Right? Because if we don't, there are very few who would do it. Or perhaps no one. 
So let's, let's pray and just give, it, give this to the Lord. Let, let, let him talk to us. Show us, Lord, where are we failing? Are we lost? Are we like the Pharisee? And we might not be. There are many of us, Lord, who are serving you faithfully. And we praise you, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would come once again in a very fresh new way, Lord. Give us the boldness and courage we need just to go and say hi to someone, to show the care and the love of a father or a mother or a sister or a brother or a friend. Lord, help us to declutter everything else that takes up our time so that we have time. We need time. And so, Lord, help us to declutter everything else. And we pray for our community, Lord, here. We pray for Karawara. And, Lord, we pray who will go to them. Who will go to them? And God, you're saying to us, you're already here. So Lord, we pray that you'd help us to go. And it is, might be difficult at times. But Lord, we pray that you'd be our strength, you'd be our guide. Lord, because it is your heart that the lost be found. That the sinner repent. That the dead come alive. So we, each of us, commit our lives into your hands, Lord. And may the work of our hands be pleasing to you as we obey your word, not just in words, Father, but also in action. So thank you, Lord. And bless us, Lord, as we go with that challenge this week. Pray that you would help us. Thank you, Jesus. One person we ask for, that we would be bold enough to go and talk to, Lord. One person, each of us. Thank you, Jesus. In your precious name we pray. Amen. We hope you enjoyed our latest episode. Tune in next week for another Live Streams Karawara message. Have a blessed week.